Marbu, welcome to Inside Intercom. Thank you so much for joining me today. And Liam, it's a pleasure for me to be with you. I uh, look forward to our discussion. I, I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about your journey to this point. Well, look, uh, ever since I got out of graduate school, I've been in the customer experience space one way or another. Whether it was my primary job or it was my secondary job, I've been having some um, you know, form of connection uh, to customer experience. And um, you know, I, I have a passion for it. I developed a, a, a passion for it after being um, involved, like I said, right out of graduate school. I had the opportunity to work um, with some very special people in the field. Um, early on, uh, there was a model called the ServQua model. Uh, my team did a lot of innovations on that. Uh, we published it. Um, that actually uh, became um, a whole issue of Marketing Research uh, Magazine. And, uh, you know, the journey has con continued on uh, from there. Early on, I got to work with people like uh, Klaus Purnell, who um, uh, pioneered the American Customer Satisfaction Index, uh, Par Parsu and Leonard Berry and Valerie Zeithamel. So, um, you know, I, I, I started off uh, there, um, but that journey has continued um, and I got a chance to work for companies like Microsoft, um, Amazon, uh, um, doing work around customer experience, right? Um, got a chance to to really, um, you know, blaze some new trails, break some new ground, um, and just an opportunity to uh, deliver some key results around um, uh, customer experience. And most recently, I was at J.P. Morgan Chase as the head of uh, customer experience for the Consumer Bank, um, you know, and uh, we, we were able to put some stellar results on the board. So. I, I love how you've kind of taken uh, all of these brilliant experiences and learnings and put them in a book uh, that came out, uh, I think, just a couple of months ago now, uh, Blueprint for Customer Obsession. What inspires you to write it? Well, look, um, you know, the phrase customer obsession is one of those phrases that is, is regularly used, you know, um, you, you see uh, Forbes, for example, will put out a, uh, a list of the most customer obsessed companies. But when it gets right down to it, everybody who uses the phrase customer obsession doesn't necessarily mean the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to tackle the whole notion of giving a really airtight definition of customer obsession using real life examples of companies that people won't argue are customer obsessed and uh, then, you know, um, give us a common language so that we, we really have, you know, evidence that we, we can put on the table when we talk about customer companies being customer obsessed. And, you know, like you say, you know, those phrases, those alternative phrases we hear are, you know, customer focus or customer centric, uh, centric, <laughs> I can't even say it, customer, customer centric. centric, there we go. Um, like, so how do you define customer obsession as, as differing from all of those other ones? Okay, so one of the things I've laid out in the book is um, the customer obsession continuum. And I've described custom um, companies all the way from customer indifferent, customer aware, customer focused, customer centric, and customer obsessed. So I want to start off by saying that, you know, even when people talk about customer focused companies, customer centric companies, they're not the same as customer obsessed companies, right? Mm -hmm. And let me say this about customer obsessed companies. They are companies who take actions and they make investments in the customer's favor even when they cannot immediately connect the dots to the financial benefit for themselves. Now, the reason they do this is because they know that it always pans out in the end. If you take the approach that what's good for customers is good for the business. All right. 
And I can give you like some very specific examples of, yeah. you know, how, how companies have, have done this. That'd be Look, great. When I was at uh, Amazon, um, we had uh, a mechanism called the Customer Experience Andon Core. What the Customer Experience Andon Core does, um, in its most basic sense, it gives customer service associates the ability to pull um, products off the Amazon site if those products are causing a bad experience for customers. Okay. Now we had business rules that would trigger a customer service associate to do that. Right. And to be quite frank, we modernized that to the point where we had uh, machine learning models and, and, you know, advanced statistical models and all those kinds of things that were actually pulling those items faster than, um, then customer service associates could detect them. But that's a pretty big deal. When you give, um, you know, an associate the, the ability to pull a product off the site so that it's not being sold. And then by the way, in the background, that would automatically trigger a whole troubleshooting um, cycle to determine what the problem was and whether that problem could be fixed so the, the product could be relisted. Right mm -hmm. now, that's extreme as compared with what you would find in, in, in other places. Right. So that's that's one kind of example of the type of thing that, uh, you know, you would have a customer obsessed company doing. Is, is there you know, you mentioned there are the kind of companies doing this and, you know, knowing that the the say the financial gain isn't going to be there immediately. Is there kind of a hurdle for companies who maybe want to be more customer obsessed to get over that, to, to you know, that it maybe it's a bit scary to, in the first place, to do that when you're not going to see these immediate uh, results? Well, and, and, and I'm not saying that they always don't see immediate results. Mm -hmm. but But what I am saying is that Maybe they're not able to connect the dots immediately, mm. okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to see immediate results, mm -hmm. right? Now, let me say this. Um, you know, one of the things that customer-obsessed companies do is they, they take dollars that they might normally put towards marketing mm -hmm. and put it towards the customer experience, Right? And so the reason that they're able to do that is because when customers have great experiences, they turn around and they tell people about it and they post about it. You know, Jeff Bezos um, it made a, a saying way back when that it used to be that when a customer had a bad experience, they would tell six friends. But now, um, you know, in the Internet age, they tell 6,000 friends. Well, look, I can tell you, are you familiar with the uh, the pet supplies company called Chewy? No, I'm not. Okay, well, well, Chewy is a company that really has a, a customer obsessed culture. And um, Chewy went from being a, you know, brand new company in six years to being the number one retailer of pet food on the internet. Wow. All right. Um, that means that there's a past Amazon in, in, in doing that. And, you know, I'll give you an example of a case where um, a customer had a pet that passed away. Right. So he contact, contacted Chewy to see if he could return, um, you know, a bag of prescription food that he had for his, his uh, dog that he wasn't going to be able to use anymore. And they told him, look, you don't have to return that. Um, they refunded him and they said he could donate it. So he didn't have to go through all, all that trouble to, to do that. And he thought, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. Well, some days later, he got an oil painting of his pet in the mail, right? With, you know, like a, a handwritten note. Wow. He, he was so touched by that, he thought, 
maybe if I post this, you know, they'll get some credit. Well, you know, between likes and repostings and all those kinds of things, you know, like more than 100,000 people saw that. Wow. So if you, if you think about, you know, what what Jeff Bezos said, it's not even 6,000 friends anymore. It's it's hundreds of thousands, you know, um, uh, of friends. And so that's one of the things that can help companies get over the hurdle because bottom line is when you, um, when you do great things for your customers, they tell others, right? They become rabid fans. Look, when I was living in the Seattle area, um, Chick-fil-A opened a, uh, a restaurant there in the Bellevue uh, suburb uh, for the first time. And um, it, it basically caused a, a, a whole traffic incident, right? The, um, the, the cars in the parking lot were coming out of the drive through backing up onto the road, around the corner, and into the ramp off the highway, which was not so far, uh, uh, you know, nearby. And so they had to bring in police, um, you know, to, to basically manage the traffic flow and all of that sort of stuff. Well, if that went on for a week, it'd be a problem. If it went on for two <laughs> weeks, <laughs> it'd be a problem. But it went on for months, right? I mean, so, you know, like these, these folks are rabid fans, right? And, and it, 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 it's so interesting because um, I, I, I read a write-up in one of the Seattle papers that said maybe it should have been a clue to the city officials when they saw people camping out in the, uh, in, in the Chick-fil-A parking lot before the store ever even opened, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, this is the thing that um, these companies, they're... they're Customers are not casual consumers. They're rabid fans. And when you have your 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 cu customers in the rabid fan zone, then, you know, they're certain, they do your marketing for you. They do your advertising for you, right? And so that's one of the ways that it pays off when, um, you know, companies go to those kinds of extremes, right? Do... Customer obsessed companies, do they, are they creating that certain type of customer? Are they attracting them? Well, I, I'm not sure I can fully answer that question, right? I mean, look, um, it's a special kind of customer that goes to the extent of tattooing um, <laughs> a brand on their arm or something like that, you know, and um, some Costco customers have gone to, to, to that extent. Um, now, you know what? Those stores do special things, right? And and customers just love it, and and they want to tell other people of it. I mean, there's there's people who have started blogs to tell others about, um, you know, what are the deals in Costco. Now, it's not like Costco doesn't send out their own flyers and all of those kinds of things to tell people what the deals are. But these folks are so excited about this, they just can't keep it to themselves. Right? Yeah. And so, um, but, but that's one of the things about um, these companies that are in that category of customer obsessed. People are constantly out there telling their story for them. And, um, you know, it's, it's organic. They don't have to to prime these people to do it. It's just they do what they do, and the customers, you know, pick up the mantle and run with it. Well, that's just, I mean, that's just it. I, I suppose I'm here in uh, Dublin, Ireland, but I have friends who've told me about Costco, <laughs> you know, across the Atlantic, uh, you know, about their return policy. And, you know, uh, so I, I suppose that's how far it extends. Well, look, I mean, um, Costco opened up in uh, in China and, you know, there was like a, a, a three hour wait to, you know, for people to get in, to get into the store. Right. I mean, so there's, you know, it, it, it inspires a certain type of, of uh, loyalty, 
um, you know, and uh, this is this is what you find with the customer obsessed companies, and and that's what I, I I I've done in the book. What I've done is I've identified eight things that differentiate these companies, you know, from others, right? Eight hallmarks, and and you know when you find a company that has has those hallmarks, they're going to be in that customer obsessed category, right? Um, and, and I, I, you know, one of the, the things that I'm talking about right now, one of those hallmarks is mm -hmm. that they bet the farm on extreme customer centric policies, right? So they, they, uh, they do these policies that really stack the odds in the customer's favor. Other folks would, would look at these policies and think you guys must be insane. <laughs> but the flip side of the story and, and, and those other companies, like you said, wouldn't have necessarily, um, you know, the mindset to go and, and replicate those policies, right? Mm -hmm. But these companies keep doing this, and with great effect. So, I, I mean, I, I love to hear from your own experiences in, you know, Amazon and elsewhere. Like, how do you create a customer obsessed culture within the company? Well, look, let me tell you, the companies that I've been in. Amazon, JP Morgan, Chase, you know, look, that mindset comes from the top, right? Let me give you an example of another kind of thing that Amazon would do. Mm. Uh, Jeff Bezos used to have something called the question mark email. Jeff was always encouraging customers to email him, okay? And um, when they did, he would take an email, he would put a question mark on it, and he would send it to one of his direct reports. And that email would filter its way down through the organization and it might land on your desk. And if it landed on your desk, basically the most senior person who had responsibility for you know, what Jeff asked about, it was your responsibility to, to, to pull together that response. And you pulled together that response knowing that any commitments that were made in that response, there definitely had to be a follow through, right? You definitely have had to have done the troubleshooting to know what the root cause was. And you weren't just fixing it for that one customer, but you were basically fixing it so that other customers would, would not have a, a similar problem, mm -hmm. right? Now, it, it's interesting because, you know, um, one time somebody asked Jeff a question. He says, so Jeff, how do you feel about it when you send one of these email and, and it randomizes a, a, a whole group for a week? He said, you know what, then it must be a very important, um, you know, problem, very difficult problem that they had to solve. And, and that person was almost saying, you know, like uh, this is interrupting the business. And his point was, no, it's not interrupting the business. This is solving serious problems for customers. We don't want those problems to be repetitive. We want to make them go away at the source, right? That's the kind of thing that comes down from the top. And, and when it comes from the top, everybody else in the chain knows that this is what it takes to be customer obsessed mm -hmm. and they're going to go out and do it. Love that. Like what would, like what is personalized customer service to you? How, you know, how do you kind of define it? Well, look, let me let me tell you a few things about, um, and, and I'm going to go again to, you know, uh, one of the the, the uh, principles or one of the hallmarks of customer mm -hmm. obsession, and that is that customer obsessed companies engage personally, right? So number one, these these companies, um, they get their customers, right? When their customers engage with them, they personalize the experiences so that that um, it doesn't it doesn't seem like, you know, like you're a stranger to that company. When you go in, you feel like, oh, these folks get me. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you uh, if you have if you have a reason to contact Amazon customer service, whether it's by chat, by phone or whatever. Right. If you do it by chat. All of a sudden, you're going to see something about the last thing that that you ordered because 
you know, they figure that you might be contacting them about the last thing that you ordered. And it'll give you options if you've ordered several things, right? So it doesn't come across like, you know, like a generic experience. It comes across like one that's tailored to you, okay? And, you know, if it's something that when you go in, the chat is not able to engage with you and solve, it'll automatically switch you over to a live agent, right? But these are the kinds of things that, that these companies do to personalize the experience. But let me go to another company. I'll take Ritz, Ritz Carlton, right? They have a, a system that they practice with their ladies and gentlemen, their associates, right? And, and what they do is they practice with those folks to, to identify unexpressed needs. So you have a family that comes in and you know the wife is expecting and, and they and they come in and normally they might have set your room up with uh champagne and something like that but maybe by the time you get up there it's switched to apple juice or you know sparkling cider or something like that you know they're 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 keying in on these needs that you haven't necessarily expressed. There was a, a customer who went to a, a Ritz. He he went paddle boarding. His his uh, shades dropped off in, in, in the water. He thought, okay, forget that. I'm never going to see those again. <laughs> Next day, somebody brings him his shades. No. <laughs> yeah, they... because somebody dived and recovered those shades for him. And, and brought it to him, right? See, that's that's obsession. That's not that's not the normal thing that you would get, and that's what personalizing the the experience means, right? Um, you know, it means giving the customer what they want before they even know they need it, because you're attuned, you're paying attention to you know um, what those customers' needs are. Um, and I, I particularly, I loved when you were talking about um, the Amazon example in terms of returning back and seeing some of the products that maybe you bought recently. So as a starting point and um, being able to switch you over to uh, a human support uh, person, I suppose that's it, it's kind of the personalization. It's the common. It's the marriage, I suppose, of human support and automation together. And I suppose with the recent release of um, OpenAI's chat gbt4 and even our own intercoms uh gbt4 powered chatbot fin and um, i'd love to ask you what you think the future has in store for customer service with ai well look i i think that ai will enable us to to really um there there have been places where um customer automation has been lacking and I think that uh, with AI, we're going to be able to take that to a, a, a whole nother level. I, and let me, let me humor me for a bit and I'll, mm. I'll, I'll share something with you. So look, um, when you use, if you're a, if you're a, a Windows user, okay, mm -hmm. there is a mental model that goes with you using Windows, right? You know where things are. You 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 know you, you know how to find things if they're not appearing. But that's partially because you have a mental model for how that works, mm -hmm. right? If you're a Mac user, that mental model is different. Okay. Now let's th think about apps in your phone, for example. If you use a banking app, if you use multiple banks, okay, the organization of those apps is different. And so where you look for things or where you find things or what even in the app, you know, you don't necessarily have a mental model for how to do that. Mm -hmm. But also, if your mental model is different than the designer's mental model, okay, you might have trouble finding stuff. So when you, when you think about now, if I have an AI, um, you know, an AI assistant to help me navigate those apps. Mm. If I have an AI assistant, uh, assistant to help me um, navigate IVRs on the phone, right? 
then that mental model thing goes out the window because that automated assistant now is smart enough to figure out a is the thing you're looking for even there b it can go find it and bring it to you mm -hmm. right and um so that that will change the dynamics right of um it will change the dynamics of of how customer service is delivered in a lot of different ways and, and think about this um I, I don't know how directly you experienced this but but during COVID, when um, we went from a, a state where at the beginning of the week on Monday, um, call centers were fully operational everywhere. And by Thursday, um, everywhere in the world, those you know um, call centers were being shut down. Now, some people were, were in a great position where they were using call center software, where they're their customer service associates could essentially pick up a laptop, take it home, plug in, and fire the whole thing up and keep working. But there was a lot who weren't. Now imagine if you had your, um, you know, uh, digital assistants, right, with AI capabilities to be able to help service customers under those conditions, right? I mean, that would make a huge difference. So that's where I see that, uh, you know, we can have uh, AI make a huge difference. And, and I'm sorry it took me that long to answer the question, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, you, you get a pretty rich idea of how this can come together. Yeah, no, exactly. That's, that's the nail on the, uh, the nail on the head. Um, what's next for you? Do you have any, uh, you know, big plans or projects for 2023? Well, look, I've got a few things, uh, you know, that I'm, that I'm working on to, to bring together. Uh, one of them is something called the customer obsession uh, barometer, if you will, that I'm looking to uh, take companies and, and really create a ranking based on these hallmarks of customer obsession, right, to, to be able to um, really give companies a, a, good, um, a good assessment of where they fit in the customer obsession spectrum, right? So, so that's one thing. I'm also looking to um, launch uh, some CXO circles uh, that I would moderate where we would have um, you know, folks coming together around um, some very hot customer experience topics and um, you know, like sharing with one another, but also having me um, inject uh, you know, certain um, you know, uh, insights into it as well like we're doing now so so those are you know some of the hot things that i have on the horizon that sounds great um, and so where can people go to keep up with you uh, you know uh, and your work well i would give people two places uh to go mm -hmm. one of them is my website which is customerobsession.net mm -hmm. right um but also folks can um connect with me on linkedin um, the key thing, let me spell it out so folks know how to spell my name because it's not very common. So it's M-A-R-B, like boy, B-U-E, Marbu Brown. There's not too many of those on LinkedIn. And so, uh, you know, if they just, uh, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on LinkedIn, that would be a great way to connect as well. Perfect. I'll put all of those in uh, the description and the show notes. Marbu, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, spending the time with you. And uh, I really hope that folks who listen in get some nuggets that they can take and use right away.